Luis Antonio Tagle, at 55, is the second youngest cardinal in the Catholic Church. The Archbishop of Manila is already considered one of the leading candidates to succeed Benedict XVI. So, when I met him in Rome just after being made a cardinal, I was curious to ask him about his relationship with Joseph Ratzinger. I was appointed by Pope John Paul II to the Theological Commission, the International Theological Commission, in 1997. And that commission was, uh, is under, up to now, is under the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. And so the prefect at that time was Cardinal Josef Ratzinger. Then you have opportunities to, to share with one another. I guess the Holy, Holy Father now got to know many of us. Your Eminence, the Church is a minority in Asia besides the Philippines. So what does it mean, new evangelization for Asia? The new evangelization is taking seriously the context, the phenomena, and seeing how the faith could still be uh, transmitted. How could it be received? How do we help people listen attentively and receive the good news in changing times? Some places in Asia still need what we call first evangelization. But in many parts of Asia, too, we, we see already the effects of global trends affecting not only Christianity, but affecting all the other religions. Uh, when you talk with people from the Hindu religion, from uh, the, the Confucian, the Taoist, the Buddhist, uh, even our brothers and sisters uh, among the uh, observers of Islam, they see how contemporary trends affect the practice of the faith. And so I think there is a, in Asia some sort of a consensus that all religious groups must look for new expressions of what they believe in, understanding the world so that we can employ new methods, and uh, also how to enliven new energy uh, for our faith. The Church is slowly disappearing in North America and in Europe, while it is growing rapidly in continents such as Asia or Africa. Why do you think it's so, and what does it mean for the future of the Church? You know, the Church has seen so many different forms of existence in history. Yeah, it began as a small group, you know, uh, uh, a group of itinerant and uh, traveling uh, disciples of Christ, uh, preaching, and some, some uh, were able to win. <laughs> <laughs> followers, some were rejected and even killed, you know. And then there was a time when uh, almost whole populations would uh, flock to the church, and then moments also of, of uh, reform and etc. So uh, when, when, when this is happening now, uh, some sort of a decrease in numbers, this is not the first time that the church uh, uh, is uh, experiencing a diminution uh, in numbers. But at the same time, this is a calling for us. You know? uh, does our faith and the, does the life of the church depend on numbers only? Okay? Uh, you may have a big, big uh, a congregation, but does that automatically translate into uh, a vitality of faith? Does crowd, does a crowd mean that the church is more alive than when you have, for example, a chapel with only 15, uh, 15 parishioners, now, which is quite normal in some parts of Asia. You know? I don't have the heart to tell them, since you are only 20 in this parish, the church is dead. No, it is alive. Now, of course, we would prefer to have more <laughs> Christians, more Catholics, but we cannot equate the life or the death of the church only on numbers. That's why I was quite inspired, too, by some directions coming from our present Pope, Pope Benedict XVI. He, 
he is a calming, calming uh, presence too. No, he would say, well, if the church, for example, in the West, becomes a, a minority, then for as long as that minority has deep faith, lives by the faith, no, uh, witnesses to the faith, then the church is vibrant. Uh, but during the synod, I think everyone, not just the church in the northern hemisphere, the, the whole church was invited to do some soul searching and to engage in a, a, what we might call a corporate examination of conscience and consciousness. It is one thing to look at the world and say, these phenomena affect religion. And that is important. We need to understand. We need to understand those, uh, but we also must look into ourselves and see how we as a church, how have we witnessed to the gospel? Yes, trends are operating in the world that might eclipse the brilliance of the faith, but within the church, we are also called to review our lives. Maybe our own sinfulness, our own laxity, our own lack of, uh, of fervor, our lack of engaging, especially the youth, in the, the joy of being believers, maybe, and then maybe also the scandals, all of these have caused some uh, pains on people which have led them, in a way, to distance themselves from the church. The recent synod discussed a lot about secularization. And my question is, is secularization something that is here to stay and that the church has to learn to live with? Or is it, as it was said in the synod, a tsunami, and so something that is here, but that the church can push back, that it can wait, that it will be past and not be here anymore? I think what people normally mean when they're talking about secularization is a tendency to dwell only on this world. It's bordering on materialism. It's bordering on a denial of the transcendent and even of the presence of God. In the writings of these popes, uh, even with Pope John the Twenty-Third, they are conscious of the fact that the world has been changing rapidly. There are many uh, factors that have been uh, shaping cultures and mentalities, affecting all aspects of life, including faith. Cardinal Tagle, you have been among the first ones in Asia to speak strongly about the sex abuse crisis. Do you think you have been listened to? When uh, the Vatican, with the uh, Pontifical Gregorian University uh, uh, organized a colloquium, and I was, and it was an international colloquium. So people from different parts of the world were asked to contribute, and I was asked to contribute from the experience of Asia. And there, I, I was surprised. I was surprised uh, because, according to the evaluation um, <laughs> given by the participants, my presentation was one of those that they appreciated the most. And when the participants were asked, they say it's because of the more holistic approach and a pastoral approach, which is very Asian. You do not try to hide the problem. But looking at the problem, you respond as pastor. The church responds as mother church. You know? So you care. You care for the victim. You care for the families of the victims. You care also for the abuser who is definitely lost. You know? And you don't want that person just to, to continue being lost. You, know? you take care of the community where the abuse happened. You take care of the families, both of the, of the victim and the abuser. This is a very Asian uh, approach, you know, and, uh, and, and it is... That, that approach leads to healing, you know, healing, uh, but healing based on justice, based on truth. You know. 
Cardinal Tagle, do you think that if the church in Asia tackles the sex abuse crisis head on before it explodes in the media, it will avoid the crisis of trust that the church suffered in Europe and North America? Yes, I think so. Uh, culturally, the Asians, when you show Asians concern, genuine concern, and uh, you extend help, uh, the, the, the healing process already begins. Uh, I think for us, legal action, you know, exposing uh, persons, uh, uh, both victims and abusers, you know, to uh, the public, either through media or legal action, that adds to the, the pain. And so if the church could address this issue f swiftly by being the caring, healing, and just community that she is supposed to be, then I think for Asia it will work. It will work. Mm -hmm. There are many conflicts in the world now that have religious undertones, so-called religious motives. What can the church do to improve relations between the faiths as the, the church in Asia is used to living among other faiths in community with other faiths. So what can the church do to uh, diffuse these conflicts? Uh, since its inception in 1970, the Federation of Asian Bishops Conferences has already identified inter-religious dialogue as one of the paths for mission in Asia. And that has been taken seriously. And more so now, when, as you said, I don't know why, but conflicts which were originally ethnic, political, cultural, are now being given a religious flavor. And it is not just the church or Christianity that is suffering from that. All the other religions, when they, their names are used to justify acts of discrimination and injustice and violence, all religions suffer. But when you study, no religion uh, will tolerate that. Okay? And so we are hopeful because on the level of the Asian bishops' conferences and on the level of the uh, local episcopal conferences, there have been, these past 40 years, official dialogues, uh, sessions, encounters, among the leaders of the religious groups. So on the level of leadership, you know, we, we are in a way quite clear about that. You know? And we are even encouraging people to open their eyes. These are not religious conflicts. These are really economic, ethnic, political issues which they are not addressing as such. And they are using religion as a cop-out or a convenient, uh, convenient uh, camouflage for their failure to address poverty, ethnicity, you know, and social inequalities. Unfortunately, too, some uh, uh, rigid governments, I think, uh, would like such conflicts to remain as religious conflicts. Thank you.